It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event, uh, Learning from Sound with Hildegard Westerkamp, in conversation with the residents of Praxis's 17th residency, Climata, Capturing Change at a Time of Ecological Crisis. Um, after completing her music studies in the early 70s, Hildegard shifted the focus of her research beyond music to the acoustic environment as a broader space and context for intense listening. As a composer, educator, and radio artist, most of her work since the mid 70s is centered on environmental sound and acoustic ecology. Hildegard's compositions have been for, performed and broadcast to international audiences. She's composed film soundtracks and sound documents for radio. And she's a founding member of the World Forum of Acoustic Ecology, where from 2000 to 2012, she served as chief editor in its journal Soundscape, the Journal of Acoustic Ecology. Between 1981 and 1991, uh, Hildegard taught on the Acoustic Communication Program in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. Um, yeah, so today's event takes place alongside Praxis's 17th residency, as I said, but um, it also takes place alongside an exhibition under the title Klima 2 Plus, which is taking place at the Norsk Technos Museum, Norway's Museum of Science, Technology and Medicine. Um, and the residency brings, the residency climata brings together nine people to explore topics relating to sound and ecology. And it's been developed with German sound artist Lasse Mark Rieck and the Goethe Institute Norway. Uh, it also includes collaborations with Grim Recorder, Technus Museum and Northam, uh, which is Norway's center for technology and music and the arts. Um, so this event is also part of a series relating to sound and ecology. And if you'd like to find out a bit more about some of the other events that are happening, there is a link at the top of the chat. Um, so yeah, it's really lovely to have you all with us. Uh, what I was thinking of doing for this um, session was to propose a little um, listening journey um, that will allow us to go through a few of my compositions over the years from early on to fairly recently and they will um by listening to them and talking about them they will bring up topics about listening about ecology about culture about um not about food so much but <laughs> uh, but <laughs> maybe that too um and in other words what i'm saying is that we will we will get to um, the topics through the pieces because my my artistic work mostly is very much connected to how life uh, how life treated me how my life went and so there's always a very strong interaction between which i mean is with every artistic work really but i think um it's perhaps uh, sometimes more 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 glaringly clear that it's connected to my personal life. Um, uh, I have never felt that there's a separation between my artistic work and my personal living. And so in that context, um, the personal, the political, the public, uh, the cultural, all those intermesh all the time. So um, I'm, I will just take you through some of these pieces and um, I would like to invite you um, after we have listened to each of them to uh, come up with some questions, comments, whatever you uh, want to ask, especially from the residents who um, may be in the middle of their own work and may have some questions in terms of artistic process, in terms of how does your artistic profess, process relate to what's going on in the world right now, what's going on in, in life right now. So um, I was going to uh, play you a, a piece called Whisper Study, which is um, the very first composition that I've ever made.
no sound. Hearing is most alert. There are places in the imagination where the sound falls into itself like freezing. Where the soft crackle of ions moves into the air on snow feet made of fine wire. Suddenly you are there from behind a boulder where you have been watching the moss begin. And it's as if somebody were filling a strangely shaped cup with water from a tap somewhere close to your ear. And you have the memory of vast distances with hawks on the horizon where the world became a kind of ache, a species of limb that is part of the larger universe. And suddenly nothing is so real as these hands wanting always to touch things, or these eyes which disappear immediately into the rivers like a breed of nocturnal salamanders. At night, you can hear the bones of the forest, the ancient ones making terrible love. You can hear the wind, the godfather beating his ice wings. Um, when I was composing it, I was really not clear that I was composing. I was not a composer. I was just learning techniques in the studio uh, here in Vancouver at the World Soundscape Project where I was working with uh, R. Murray Schaefer and my colleagues. And we were researching um, the soundscape. We were uh, involved in a project called the Vancouver Soundscape here and in many, many other projects that had to do with the sound environment a fascinating time for me, uh, but I had just pretty much finished teaching, uh, uh, studying music and teaching in a school and I was not a composer. I had never composed before. Uh, but we had this research studio, the Sonic Research Studio at Simon Fraser University. And I had observed my colleagues, um, five males and myself, I'd like to mention, <laughs> um, that who all worked in the studio. And I came in quite, you know, not knowing anything, observing, listening, uh, learning, and then becoming very, very interested in learning it myself. So Whisper Study was, um, came out of a kind of a workshop that we had done about extended vocal techniques in contemporary music. And I thought, why don't I try something in the studio? Um, and uh, my colleague Barry Truax showed me the kind of the classic electronic music studio techniques of um, uh, delay feedback. You know, this was an analog studio with, um, with uh, tapes and uh, we would have loops and we would do delay feedback. We would also have, of course, um, filters and uh, 
possibilities to slow down the tape, to change the speed and all that. So I learned those things and um, I was, um, my decision was an interesting one. I decided to work with a sentence, um, when there is no sound, hearing is most alert. And this is from Kirpal Singh. It was a quote that uh, appears in Murray Schaefer's book, The Tuning of the World. And we had talked a lot about it. We had talked a lot about meanings of silence. Um, how do we understand silence culturally, personally, all that. And um, the mere fact of thinking that when there is no sound, hearing is most alert to me was a fascinating idea. And we, in a way, practice it by doing a lot of listening. And um, then I thought I would whisper the sentence and record myself whispering it. Of course, in an analog studio, that's a huge challenge because you're dealing with a very, very quiet sound. And as you're copying and processing sounds in an analog studio, you accum accumulate noise, hiss. And so having a whisper and having to deal with accumulating hiss um, was a challenge for me. And so I learned immediately to try to do the best quality sounds, copying, processing, highest quality, otherwise it wouldn't work. So I had to record that whispering very high volume so that I could turn it down to make it uh, very transparent, quiet, and, and beautiful. Um, so immediately, without knowing really anything about this, I had challenged myself to work with quiet in the studio. Um, so the piece basically is uh, a process of, of um, uh, sh basically showing the techniques of, of um, in the analog studio with the delay feedback, voice overlays, etc., like that, and starts really, really quietly. And eventually I discovered what happens to the whispered sound when it's mixed with each other, when you slow it down. And I discovered a, a sound density of a very fluid nature, uh, liquid sounds almost, like all the S's and T's and D's and stuff were almost like gurgling water. And to me, that was a, an incredible discovery. I was so excited. I was, you know, in my late twenties at the time or mid twenties and all this was completely new to me. So there was this revelation of a recorded sound being processed and then becoming something else. Um, to me, that was a, a real aha moment and has kind of um, given me this love for working with sounds in the studio and with processing them. And part of the idea of processing a sound in the studio was um, it reminded me of what we do when we listen anyways. We process. As soon as we listen, we process. We interpret. We change it. It becomes ours. And that to me was the key understanding of why I would want to process recorded sounds in the studio because they to me represented what our listening um, process is in, is in fact is. Otherwise, just to process it for processing sake didn't make much sense to me. So it had to kind of connect to the, the, way, we, the way we listen, the way we process things within ourselves. And um, eventually uh, the piece was a certain version and uh, later on my, my then husband who was a poet um, uh, was inspired to, to uh, write a, po a poem uh, with these words and so the last part of the piece is that poem and that was recorded on a sound walk that I recorded in the mountains with snowy footsteps, icicles, also very high frequency sounds and that completes the piece. So I think that piece is available to the residents um, if they want to listen to it uh, on their own, right? Um, just so to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, really how all this originated for me. So the connection to the work with the World Sounds Project, which was highly um, environmentally conscious, it was very, uh, uh, it, it was trying to 
really, we were trying to wake up people's ears. That was Schaefer's style too. He liked to rattle us all a bit. Let's listen, let's listen, find new things. And um, let's be surprised all the time. Let's change the world indeed. It was the 60s and 70s. That's what we wanted to do. So um, it was a, a, a world on edge, not quite as on edge as it is right now, but uh, we were wanting to change the world. And we um, certainly within ourselves learned to change our listening, learned to, to um, uh, begin to relate to the environment, the, the soundscape in a way that it is just as important as any other perception of the world and that it tells us something in different ways. Uh, when we listen, we are in touch with time passing. And when, we, when time passes, we necessarily um, are in step with that time if we are listening. Time passes in the step of listening, with, in step with the sounds that we're hearing. And so it puts us in touch with the world on a quite a different level. And I think many of us have experienced that maybe in a more acute way in the last uh, four or five months because of COVID, um, where suddenly many, many sounds, especially at the beginning of COVID, dropped away. And our ears were uh, waking up to the fact that there were other sounds emerging in, in the environment that uh, we now could pay attention to. And, you know, people, people were mentioning more birds, whether they were actually more birds, we don't know, but they, suddenly they were heard. Um, the same thing with um, people were beginning to sing. There was a sound making activity because of the lack of communication. The, the, suddenly there was communication there. There were things happening where the balance between a listening to the world and the sound making with each other as human beings was shifting quite a bit. And that was a very interesting experience for most of us and um, could be seen as a, to me, a very much symbolic to uh, what is happening generally is that under these conditions, voices emerge nowadays that have not been heard in a clear way, in as clear a way as um, they are heard now. And they are also perhaps daring to be a little bit louder because um, there, is a, there is a hope that they're being listened to. Um, so we can see this in this in this larger context very much so, um, and um, I think what's really positive about this time, hard as it is and crazy and chaotic and uh, doomsday as it can be, there is an opportunity here to really pay attention to how our perception has shifted, and. Yeah, that, that shift happened really on the same day in the studio when I was discovering that my whispering sounded like a river. And that was kind of a pleasure. So um, let's uh, move on, maybe better do. <laughs> um, I, I'm just, are there any questions at this point or shall I just continue? What do you think? I will just continue. Um, so we will do some listening now, aside from the listening to our homes here. And I see many of you have headphones on, which is great. If you have really good speakers, of course, feel free to listen on, on those speakers. Um, it, interestingly enough, when Nicholas and I were talking, we, um, and I was beginning to select pieces for this, uh, they all, a lot, three of them ended up having either the word silent in, in the title, or being uh, relating to the experience of silence. Um, this next piece is called Cricket Voice. Some of you might know it. Um, it uh, originated from an experience that I had with a group of artists in the Mexican desert called the, the Zone of Silence. Uh, it's in the northeastern region of Mexico, and it is called that because it has uh, particular magnetic qualities that um, uh, make some regions uh, 
so if you have a car, if you drive through it, or if you park your car in that, your battery will be drained. You won't have radio communication. You won't have any communication with the outside world. Um, we were camped in an area that was not that because we we needed our batteries for <laughs> recording and filming and all those things. Um, but um, we were in a very quiet environment. We were in a desert. We were far away from any community. It was a very small village a, a kilometer away. We literally for three weeks heard two jets in that whole time and uh, if we saw a car in the distance, the sound was absorbed. We could not hear it. We had a truck which we sometimes used, but generally speaking, we were in, a, in an environment that was very, very sparse acoustically. During the day, it was mostly our sounds, our voices, our footsteps, um, uh, not much else actually. And at night were the crickets. And um, in, in that experience of quiet, uh, we came to a point after, after some days that we needed more sound. We wanted sound, we desired sound. We had never been, I had never been in an experience where sound wasn't constantly coming at me. And so suddenly there was this experience of complete absence of sound with little, little sounds from nature, tiny ones, whispery ones. And um, we suddenly wanted to make sound. We started to make, uh, we found an old water reservoir where we sang and we made, it was just ruins of a water reservoir, just um, parallel walls and we clapped in them and we, um, we got some feedback from this water reservoir that was a pleasure. And so we became musicians at that point, which was a really interesting experience. Uh, to come out of this experience of silence into wanting to make sound. Um, the, the other thing was that I was the only composer and I had a microphone and I wanted to record sounds. Well, during the day, other than us, there was not much. And so I began to touch plants. There were cacti with spikes and uh, old mm, dried up palm trees and leaves. And so I began to touch the environment, almost like a, a drumming kind of place and uh, recorded those sounds that, that the environment, the materials of the environment gave us. So, you know, there was an experience of, oh, the instruments are right here. The instruments are in this place and that's how instruments are originally made, musical instruments are made. Um, so there were exciting discoveries because of that quiet the potential of the quiet. And um, then the cricket uh, is another story of its own. I was in at night, wanted to go into the desert and record crickets. I placed myself somewhere and recorded crickets generally. And then one little cricket started to come forward and it was almost like I couldn't see it. It was almost like it had a solo performance in front of my microphone for two minutes. and. Uh, I tried to follow it with a microphone uh, and it would stop. And so we had this little game of playing and stopping. If I would bump into something, it would stop and then it would start again. Two minutes of a solo, almost like a studio recording, it was so quiet. So this recording gave me uh, what, what Pierre Schaeffer would call a sound object. <laughs> uh, it was so clear and so wonderful that I could take that into the studio and start to process it. And that was a delicate moment because did I, why would I want to change the sound? Why would I want to become electronic with it? It became a bit of a moral question for me. And then I discovered mostly through slowing it down, that it started to sound like a heartbeat in the very uh, slowed down version. Um, and it started to make some sense that, uh, yes, I would like to want to discover that. So the slowed down version then made me discover the, the intricacies and the depth of this beautiful little sound. And when I went, then was listening to the original, it uh, made me listen differently to it. And so I felt a little more comfortable with 
with that kind of processing. I tried a few other things and yeah, they, they're a little bit more playful and they're fun and you can hear them in the piece. Um, and um, it was an exploration to me, it became more and more an exploration of um, the, the small sounds in nature that are easily over, not heard, that are easily uh, perhaps mowed down or ignored. Um, and so why not amplify these voices? Why not let them speak loudly and clearly with all their beauty? So this piece, Cricket Voice, is a combination of that voice, um, of us making sounds. Um, you'll hear some wind sounds that are um, like, uh, let me describe it. We had some branches in our hand and we were doing not with our mouth, but with the branches, these sounds started to come. So we had a dance and I recorded that. Um, there's a few other foot stomping, clapping, that's our sound made, making aspect. And then there's the touching of the instruments. I mean, the, um, the cacti and the plants who became instruments. So those are the ingredients of the piece. And that is Cricket Voice. And I'm giving you all this simply because you are all practicing artists and you know about artistic process and you know how important it is to notice details in your artistic process in order to move on to move through this process and so it's not to explain what you what i did it's more to connect with give you an opportunity to connect your own artistic process at home.
I was imagining what it would be like if we had all unmuted and we had <laughs> all those on our speakers and we would get a delayed, multiply delayed version of the same piece. <laughs> um, very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the time and I'm just, I would like to invite questions um, if there are any uh, or any comments for maybe a few minutes. Um, I have two small questions. Um, first one is, it's actually maybe more a comment, but what I um, find really fascinating and uh, intriguing is how you somehow, like it's in this piece that is present, but also uh, mostly I heard it in um, another piece, Talking Rain. And it's about like, there's some very vital energy and like uh, some sort of fertility in the sounds that I think is, um, yeah, it's very beautiful how you can capture this. And I'm wondering if it's something you maybe work on intentionally. And if, for example, with the example of the rain, if it also now like um, considering the ecological changes, if it's, if your relationship also changed when you hear the sounds, if it's even more, um, special or it feels even more vital and fertile when there's rain now, for example. Mm -hmm. um, when you speak of energy, um, that energy is in the sounds that, that I recorded. Um, that, that energy is in the existing soundscape. So it really requires for us to notice it and to, to understand them. Uh, that's over the years, I think that's what you do when you record sounds. Many of you are field recordists. Um, you suddenly you're monitoring with your headphones what the microphone picks up. So your microphone is a, is a new ear to you. It's a different ear than your own. It goes through your ear and you notice something. And uh, you notice something different because you're not just doing your daily life listening or 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 cutting out sounds. You're actually wanting that sound to arrive in your uh, as an audiophile, and you're interested in it, right? So your ears are really, uh, there's desire behind that. And whatever nature that desire has, um, it you will then meet that sound with your own energy, and together you create a piece. So um, sometimes people don't understand the depth of that process, because often I'm asked, um, how do you work? Like, do you have a structure beforehand? Do you, do you um, decide how, you know, do you make a, f a formal a score or whatever? Uh, no, actually, um, the sounds are the basis and my listening to it uh, then creates a, 
perhaps an energy where um, the structure emerges out of that. So as you're listening to the sounds that you've recorded, and as you also listen to the experience of that recording, the experience of being out there, and your own understand your own listening more, you begin to uh, extract that energy into your composition. And with talking rain, it's very similar. I mean, you know, you, when you record rain sounds, and here in Vancouver, we have lots of it, um, you, you hear the subtlety of, of uh, rain. Every, every touch, every drop touches a different surface. And that creates a, a drumming sound, that creates one very unique sound. And if you record all those different situations, you get this huge variety of sounds, right? And, and then you also learn something about the rhythms of rain, the overall rhythm of rain. Like on the West Coast here, we can have days and days and days of rain. Um, where I grew up in North Germany, we have a lot of rain, but it's more like it's showers. And, and then it's over for a while and they surprise you. And there's a whole different structure there. So. Talking Rain was, was very much based on the experience of being on the West Coast here um, and the experience of recording. So, yeah, that, does that explain it a bit? In, in, in fact, what I'm saying is it has to do with a re your relationship with the environment and your recordings. It's, it's about relationship. And there is energy in that relationship. And if you can hear that in the pieces, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. And Sorry, one last question. Do you, some, do you feel like um, the technologies, how they have changed over time, that it also like, changed the way you work or not really? Because I imagine there's like endless possibilities uh, yeah. all of a sudden and sometimes yeah, you know like where to stop or how you, can, you could process endlessly. And I'm wondering if you have like, noticed an evolution, yeah, probably in your life, that because you have had... Um, yeah, the changes were huge. Um, initially, we were excited because uh, recording the environment was a very new thing in, in the 70s. And to have a tape recorder and to be able to record the world like that was magic. And so that, that determined everything. When I did my program sound walking, I just recorded uh, Vancouver and I used my own voice to, to explain to the radio audience what day it was, where I was, or, or whatever was trying to be the mediator between the radio audience and, and the soundscapes that I was recording. And that was very, very exciting because it just really hadn't been done all that much. And we were recording everything. And that also included recording people, never asking permission whether we could put, broadcast them, also never asking any names, names, so it was anonymous, but so there was a whole different relationship. We were just wanting to be open to the whole world. And we wanted to give that world on our Vancouver cooperative radio station, a voice, which that the environment had no voice in the media at that point. You did not have background now, noises in the media or in the news. You were not put to the place where the news came from. That was completely new. Um, and so, and, and the equipment was heavy and, uh, you know, I had big headphones, I had big microphones, everybody noticed me, people asked me what I was doing. Now you can go and nobody will know that you're recording. Um, completely different attitude, completely different interrelationship. You can be a voyeur if you want to be. Uh, you can be secretive, you can be, uh, it's not, a, it's not, clearly out there, your relationship as a recordist to the world, right? So that has changed enormously. My recording, um, really I slowed down doing recordings quite a bit because I have too many and it feels like it, it's an overload and how can I ever listen to all of that? And um, so uh, when I was in India, and maybe this is, is this a good segue to the next short piece perhaps? Um, it is a short piece um, and it is very much based on the experience of having done that um, radio program sound walking in the late 70s uh, where you record the environment and um, then you, uh, you, you as a listener are present and you are offering your perspective on, 
or your relationship to what you're recording and you're wanting to inform the listener about the place where you are, about the situation where you are. Um, and because I've always had a bit of an educational desire to, you know, educate people about listening and, and open them up, this is also part of the, um, the voice that I have in quite a few of my pieces. So if anybody wants and knows Kids Speech Soundwalk, that's very much based on the Soundwalking show. This next piece that we're hearing is, is uh, just a field recording that I made in India during the wedding season. In, in, I was in Udaipur in Rajasthan and uh, basically the piece tells it all. So I won't tell you all about it, but it is, um, yeah, it tells you everything. Um, it's completely straightforward. There's no processing going on. Yeah, I shortened it to, to four, f five minutes, I think. Mm, and right. uh, there's some that's editing. Right. Um, but that's, that's about it. And then there is the ed added narrative voice. In this case, I did not narrate that during the recording, which is what I did in sound walking. I did in the field, I recorded. Um, in this case, the narrative was created afterwards. And I was a, an absolutely astonished visitor to India. I had given a soundscape workshop in Delhi and I was, my mind was pretty much blown by the completely different cultural exposure that I had. My Eurocentric and North American cultural biases were completely shaken up and, and um, I felt like a baby, you know, put uh, after birth holding the feet and uh, <laughs> making it making it cry, the old fashioned way of waking up a baby after birth. Um, I felt a little bit like that in this absolutely fascinating culture completely overwhelming for me, but joyful and, and a huge revelation. So you can hear a bit of that in the narrative um, that I am the visitor, I am the onlooker uh, to a scene that I would have never experienced in my life before in Europe or North America. So um, Nicholas, can we yeah. listen to, it's called Silent Night. Here we have the word silent again, and you will find out why it's yes. called silent night in the end silent night november 26 1997 this is the season of weddings in india last night we witnessed a glittering rich version from the rooftop terrace of our hotel some relative of the Maharaja of Udaipur was getting married. Musical sounds floated up to us from where the guests were gathering to receive the bridegroom. Gradually distant bands mingled with the music below. Drums, trumpets and euphoniums were approaching from our left, getting louder and at times covering up the other music. We can see the band now, a whole procession of instruments, lights and people accompanying the bridegroom who is arriving on a magnificently decorated elephant. A majestic scene, but the music sounds just as raunchy as at any ordinary Indian wedding. On the street below, another small procession of uniformed musicians enters the already dense musical soundscape with its own strangely incoherent wedding band sound and disappears again around the next corner. Another wedding procession announces itself with explosions from firecrackers. Two glittering bridegrooms on horseback and huge musical clamor. This time there's no live band, 
Instead, one of those loudspeaker carts is pushed through the streets and blasts out similarly raunchy music with Max Reverb, in tandem with a live band still playing at the other venue. I can't help but think of Charles Ives' music as I hear all this. Cars, scooters, auto rickshaws are not deterred and squeeze past the procession, honking their way through the music-filled street. In the middle of all this, as if there was still room for more sounds, we suddenly hear electronic fragments of silent night. The source, a small passenger car. Every time the driver puts the car in reverse gear, this electronic signal is turned on, continuing the tune of Silent Night wherever it had stopped the last time he drove backwards. As the driver maneuvers the car back and forth and back and forth in a small alleyway, we are ear witnesses for several minutes to Silent Night being ripped into small sonic shreds. I think we're back after that clamor. Um, so I, I just wanted, yeah, Nicholas? I, well, I could say, I can see there's, there's a, a few questions coming up in the chat at different points, some of them. Uh, but I can is, see there's one immediately from that, which is, uh, is there really no layering in, in the recording of that piece? None whatsoever. No layering. Just edited closer together a little bit. Like it was a recording of, probably half an hour or, or longer. So it, you know, uh, I brought the best parts together. So yes, there may have been in that half hour recording some slightly quieter, but not really because the street was just busy. Um, yeah. Also yeah. That, that piece is, is that half an hour for the five minutes or half an hour for the normal length? Because that's an excerpt, isn't it? No, no, this is just the excerpt of yeah, a recording exactly. I made, yeah. Yeah. So edited together for the purpose and, and uh, also just, the, you know, my narrative of it um, uh, determined a little bit of how I condensed the recording. Yeah. yeah and and, uh, and it's, it's part of, an, it's part of a, a larger piece called the India Sound Journal. So in that journal, I have different situations uh, from India that, I, that w just were highlighted for me uh, with a narrative. Yeah. And I think you you talked uh, in in relation to Cricket Voice and your general practice about how much recording material you built up, and for me that that kind of and you're then kind of stepping back from making new recordings or thinking about the responsibility of recording and in a way the ethics of recording and what you do with the material you have and how you can work with things. But I think this piece for me also the, is the kind of the fascination of, or like the kind of the ethics of the fascinated onlooker and what you then do with the material is an interesting thing to deal with in, in this piece. Is that something you're happy to talk about? Yes, like how you thought about what you did with it once you recorded it? Yeah, well, it's interesting because as I said earlier that when we first had microphones and we realized we could record the whole world, but there were no ethics really, or the ethics were were that we wanted to record it and, and uh, and broadcast it and inform the world about 
uh, the soundscape and let's listen to this incredible place that we have recorded here. Let's really give it its due. That was the sort of the atmosphere in the 70s when we we're doing all this work and into the 80s. Um, uh, now, then as I personally accumulated a lot of recordings and then as the world started to accumulate huge recordings, I began to wonder what are we actually going to do with all this. And yeah, for the educational purposes, for the ear opening, for changing our relationship to the environment in an ecological way, I think this is very important. Um, the nature recordists, um, you know, uh, Chris Watson, um, uh, Bernie Krauss, all these incredible people who have done so many incredible nature recordings. It's very important work. Um, I have never considered myself a field recordist in that sense. Um, more of an educator, composer perhaps on that line. So what happened to me in India was interesting is as I was recording in this incredibly um, busy, polyphonic, beautiful culture, um, I felt that I was cutting myself off with my microphone on headphones. Even though I was listening to it over the headphones and more intensely, I felt cut off from experiencing the culture. And that uh, dichotomy I had never really experienced before in that intensity. I felt socially uh, cutting off. I felt perhaps a bit of a voyeur. Um, it, it, it was a very strange uh, relationship that happened there. And so I became very thoughtful about that. And actually, since the gradually over the years, um, I became much more interested in just listening. So in Vancouver, we have a group called the Vancouver Soundwalk Collective, which came out of the initiative of uh, the Vancouver New Music to have um, regular sound walks as part of the concert season in Vancouver. And um, we've been doing this now since 2003 and doing sound walks like that without, without mostly not recording them. We, we use very little equipment for this. Sometimes we do for documenting or sometimes we will include it as an artistic ingredient to it. But basically we are just offering public sound walks with listening by ear and uh, leading people through a certain route. And having done that now for so many years with a, a, an ever-changing group of young people that want to lead the walks and, and are very active in that, um, has taught me a lot more about listening um, over the years than I could have imagined. Um, how do we listen when we lead a group? How do we listen when we're the participant? Um, what happens in different environments? Um, how do we listen in different weather? Um, do we go into the downtown east side, which in Vancouver is really our the dark side of Vancouver, uh, with a lot of um, people who struggle with addiction and and um, we've gone, done sound walks in there, but we have questioned, do we really want to do that? Or are we voyeurs going through there listening in silence to the life there? Um, can we do sound walks in regions of conflict? Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, can we, where can we do sound walks? What is required for people to have a safe, sense of listening um, while walking through an environment. And that brings up a lot of questions about what does it mean to be safe, socially safe as a group? Um, can, we, can we trust the context of that public space as a group that we can descend into a kind of listening where we don't feel threatened? And so questions come up that have to do with um, with social situations, with political situations, um, environmental issues. And um, it has turned, listening has turned into more of a practice as a result, a regular practice um, in daily life so that it becomes not so much you're going out to record and get a sound for your artistic work, but you are inside the experience of listening. And I think with aging and with um, 
having had all this experience, it, it's, um, it makes sense. It, it is a way of um, relating on a daily basis through your listening with all that experience um, and using your ears really as a microphone. You, you're listening as if it was a microphone. And then understanding that we can't always listen, that doesn't work. We, we have to find a rhythm. We have to find a practice of um, how, how to deal with the intensity of listening. I sometimes talk about the disruptive nature of listening, that when we really listen, it can stir us in directions that might be quite uncomfortable. And then how can we deal with that discomfort that we are suddenly listening to? So listening is a risky business. <laughs> Should we could play one more track and then have a bit more? Uh, maybe we can, can do the last one, the yeah. example two. Yeah. Um, so I'll give a quick introduction. I won't be long. Um, this one is um, more recent from 2005. Uh, well, it's 15 years ago, but <laughs> still. Um, it it um, is based on a poem by Rainer Maria Röcke, um, a love poem. And in that piece, I uh, I was concerned about, um, I wanted, I love that poem and I wanted to make a composition and I wasn't sure how to approach it. And I ended up selecting the sounds that are meaningful and that I love in Vancouver, West Coast, and in my hometown in Germany, in North Germany. Uh, and I uh, had people that men, mean lot, a lot in my life um, read the poem. So we had long recording sessions with um, um, people that I love that have with whom I have a meaningful relationship and so you will hear multiple voices um, and the part of the poem that we get to in that I'm just going to read it to you it's the final part it's not the, really quite the final part of the piece it's towards the end of the piece and the the I, I'll read you the words um, in English they're both in German my own voice is there too because I couldn't quite get as many um, German voices as I had wanted at the time. It was bad timing. So the English words are, but all that touches you. So it's a love poem that starts with, how shall I hold my soul so that it does not touch yours? That's the beginning. Then we get to, but all that touches you and touches me contracts us like a bow that from two strings draws forth a single voice. Upon which instrument are we two strung? And who, pray, is the fiddler who holds us in his hand? Oh, sweet full song. The poem is a personal poem, but it also, the longer I worked on it, it became a, um, a sense of, of what does love mean in our lives? Uh, how does love uh, connect us to the world? Um, how do we find love within ourselves to the world? And it was 2005, you know, that was um, four years after 20, uh, 2001. Um, it had become a much more restless world than it had been before. And now from then on, it's gotten even worse. So um, at that point, I felt very strongly, and now even more so, is that we really also need to understand love and what that means in terms of relating to place, to environment, to other people. And uh, so that's sort of the undercurrent behind this compositional piece. And so I surrounded myself with all the sounds and people that I loved in the studio. And it was a really wonderful experience to do that. You should try it. It's really good. <laughs> it was heartwarming for me. And so I'm hoping that um, that experience can also resonate with the listener. Obviously, that's what yeah. the composer's hope is. Yeah. So there's let's a, listen there's to a couple of as we, called, as we um, start, listening. Sorry to interrupt you, Heather. As we start yeah. to listen, there's a couple of calls in the chat to ask if you could uh, let us know the title and who wrote the poem. Just uh, right. perhaps missed it. So the poem was written by Rainer Maria Rilke. His poem is called Liebeslied, Love Song. Yeah. And my, my um, title is Für dich, for you. Thank you. Yeah, so we can listen to Für dich now. All oh, touches you and touches me. Dich with me.
But all that touches you touches, touches you and touches me. Touches me contracts, 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 us, contracts, contracts us, like a bow. Like a bow. That from two strings, from two strings draws forth a draws voice. That from two strings draws forth a single voice. Alles, was uns anrührt, doch alles, was uns anrührt, dich und mich, nimmt uns zusammen wie ein Bogenstrich, der aus zwei Seiten eine Stimme zieht. Der aus zwei Seiten eine Stimme zieht, eine Stimme zieht. there's any questions there's someone who is interested in your compositional process um whether you start from a, an idea uh, or whether you start from the recordings sorry i didn't i didn't get that last part so someone was interested in in the process uh, of your composing and whether you start from a conceptual idea or whether you start from the recordings from those um, both um, I, I usually have a um, most of the time I might have a title or might I have a general idea of what I want to do um, it, it depends really on the context um, originally uh, when I was not really a composer yet and was just 
experimenting. I was, my second composition was, uh, is, is called Fantasy for Horns. And that was because I was interested in the fog horns and the train horns and the ship horns here in Vancouver and actually on the Canadian coast. And we had all these recordings in the World Soundscape Project. Um, and I was not really a recorder myself yet. So I collected all these horn sounds. And so the horns then with the processing, the, the structure of the piece emerged because of what I was doing with a, with the horn sounds. Um, I did not have a structure ahead of mind uh, for that piece. So it kind of emerged as I was working in the studio. Uh, so it goes hand in hand, really, that, that the idea that you have, the concept that you have, and then you, you get into the nitty gritty of processing and, and, and changing, and you, suddenly you have new instruments to work with because every process sounds is suddenly a new instrument. And then it often can uh, change your original idea of where you might want to go with a piece. Um, and that's the interesting thing about in working with environmental sounds, because you're coming, you're, you're coming with a recording that is within a certain context. And sometimes you simply can't get in the processing, in the studio processing, to what you thought you might get from that sound. And then you have to change direction. You, you, you have to pay attention to the fact that this sound is in the context of a recording uh, where there's other sounds. And, um, and initially the software, um, the plugins that you could, well, so at that time it was hardware, um, you could not isolate sounds the way you can now with some of the plugins. And I'm not even familiar with a lot of the most modern plugins. Um, now you can clean up sounds and you can do anything really to ex extract them from its context. I was always interested in the context. And so whatever the recording gave me, then some parts I ended up not being able to use in a certain piece because it just never worked. But sometimes a recording that I made years ago, for instance, and ended up in this last piece, Für dich, for you. Um, there's a section that you can hear ravens having a di dialogue in the forest. Well, that piece was supposed to go into beneath the forest floor, but it never made it into that composition because it didn't fit. <laughs> um, so it just somehow the voices didn't work out there. So. Um, the conversation between you as an artist and your materials is the interesting meeting place, that liminal space that we talk about where a lot of stuff happens. And it's there where the respect for the environment and the recordings that you've made and the respect for your own listening and what you notice and other people would notice other things, that becomes important then to make your piece. So I, um, I, I cannot actually, as a composer, I'm incapable of giving myself a structure and then trying to compose that. I've never been able to do that. For me, it's always that conversation between the materials and me that creates the piece. So it's not, the, you know, the environmental sounds are composing with me. <laughs> I'm just doing it. <laughs> And there's another question in the chat, which is, uh, was, it, uh, was your consideration to add music to the vocal parts? And I think that kind of links into a question that I maybe have as well about kind of how you think about the relationship between sound, text and voice and the kind of overall uh, aims that you have for a work. What is meant by adding music to the vocal parts? Well, that's not my question. So was it your consideration to add? Yeah, so I, maybe the person has... Uh, okay, yeah. so, so, add, so what I should say is that when you say add music, um, whatever music you were perceiving in, in the context is it would have been a sound that was, uh, was created from, from the original recording. So in uh, in this case um a lot of the more musical sounds that you heard in this last piece uh were based in uh, german church bells and so that's where the musicality comes in so uh the in cricket voice when you heard more of that almost choral kind of 
sound of, of choral voices, that was the cricket. Uh, the process cricket created a, a choral atmosphere. And actually, I'm not the only one who discovered that. There were other people who on the internet suddenly said, recently had discovered that when you do something to cricket voice, to crickets, they became become like a choir. They sound like a choir. And that's what I discovered at that time in the 80s as well. So I don't know whether I'm answering that question. I think so. I think that's effectively... Well, and this, so, Jan wants I to guess, ask something. Yeah, Jan says yes, so that's, that's an appropriate answer. Okay, yeah, but <laughs> what I wanted to say is that whatever music you hear is not added music yes. with a musical instrument or electronic sounds. So they're, they're, always some, they're always based in whatever I have recorded. Yeah, hmm. that, that's where I find the most pleasure in that kind of discovery. Yeah. And Siri, you look like you I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I'm totally amazed, and it's so interesting uh, to. Um, uh, and also, I find it so interesting how you are able to make your work so spacious and so kind of um, where the perspectives and proportions and angles uh, of the. Of, of the sounds itself uh, and the space you make from that by that is um, coming up and I feel very um, like a small entity within the piece so, uh, somehow so yes. I feel like it's like make very sense uh, when you when you now say that you're uh, uh, interested in sound walks and also the perspective of, of the listener and um, I was uh, thinking of this like um, in the terms of acoustic ecology, which you have been concerned, uh, yeah, which has been a, a theme, I guess, for a while. And if you think that this term, uh, did that, has it changed some meaning for you uh, from when you started the, this, yeah, World Soundscape project and all that period and up till now, how, how would you say that this term what does it mean for you today? Uh, okay. Okay. Compared to earlier, or how do you understand what I mean? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, initially, I was fascinated by uh, Schaefer's work because he simply opened my ears. I heard a lecture of his, and it just popped out my ears and popped open my ears, and I could never shut them again. And that was fascinating to me. And so it, initially, it was more of um, uh, liberation from my music studies, actually, um, because I didn't feel all that good in the in, in the conventional music training, classical music training, and could never quite figure out why. And when this happened, I suddenly thought, oh, I can listen to the whole world as if it's music. And we can actually, and he, Schaefer used to say that, it's, you know, let's listen to it as if it was a composition. Um, so it, it was this liberation uh, from an education that I just didn't suit me. And, um, you know, I wasn't a great pianist or anything. So, you know, it, it just was not, I, I realized at that point I was fundamentally a listener. But um, so that's what guided me into it. And then in that process of working with uh, Schaefer and, and my colleagues, I became an anti-noise activist. I became um, basically, you know, fighting the expansion of the airport here or neighborhood noise or making measurements or learned everything about the science of, of noise measurements or learned everything about how our ears work, how we listen to the environment, how sound behaves in space, um, architectural acoustics. We try to learn all that uh, in this context and uh, which was fascinating. Um, so I was very much an activist and it was more that sort of um, fighting noise kind of thing at the time. We did have the term acoustic ecology. It was a new word that came up in our work and we um, explored it and created a, a, a handbook for acoustic ecology which had, has all the terms of acoustics and sound and soundscape and all that in it. Um, it was not really until uh, throughout like composing and uh, I was writing a thesis at a time in the 80s about background music and the Muzak Corporation and it was really at that point when my sort of activism 
um, turned into uh, let's think about how is sound designed in our world um, in through a corporation how is music designed through a corporation um, for profit and then it became political and it became uh, an idea of um, we really need to listen to this. We really need to listen to the music to know what it does to us and go from there. And then of course, music turned into foreground music and eventually the, the Sony Corporation and others brought it all onto our, into our ears. And now we're all listening privately to a lot of music in this world. And I think there's a lot of things we need to think about. Why is this happening and do we need it? And there are a lot of people who think they need it. And I think there's an issue of music addiction in the society. And I think there is a corporate base there somewhere. There's something to think about. So acoustic ecology now, to me, is all of that. Um, it's about uh, our relationship to the environment and how attentive are we to it. The listener is at the base, is at the absolute center of this. If we... Um, if we neglect the listening, uh, how do we find a relationship to the environment and how do we get to know it? Uh, how, much, how many of us actually have a relationship to the natural environment? Um, can we have a relationship if we're living in the city? And if we can't, what do we do? Um, the li listening, our getting to know our own listening, what kind of listener are we each of us and what kind of relationship does this listening create between us and the world and can we train that and that's when i said i have a practice of listening through all these sound walk experiences you begin to understand yourself as a listener a little bit better it is not always very comfortable um, and you also on a deeper level in the sense of Pauline Oliveros' sense of deep listening, begin to understand um, what are the deeper relationships that we want to access. And especially now in the face of climate change, um, how can our listening help us to um, access what we need to um, act and create a world that can heal from whatever is happening right now. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And are there more, would anyone like to, to voice a question? Yes, hello. hello. Hi. Hi, uh, my Hi. name is Tony uh, from Beirut and I, I work in sound field. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. It's uh, related a bit uh, because we, you've talked about sound as uh, uh, and, and the political uh, statement uh, aspect and sound. And living in, in a country, firstly in Beirut, is a very noisy city, full of sound uh, and full of conflict as well. And uh, one uh, does this conflict when we take sound, does it make it as well as like a voyeurism and, 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 and this aspect or me as living because I was based, I was born and raised in Beirut, does it make it different to, to, to have a political statement uh, uh, like reaching all the sound existing here, all the conflict existing here within the sound aspect? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I live in an environment that has been incredibly peaceful here on the West Coast and I'm very spoiled. And we have been having conversations and thinking about this, this uh, aspect of being in an environment such as yours. And you know, my India experience and my other travels in the world have certainly uh, opened me up to the fact that there is an absolute overload situation in many people's lives. Uh, in, in urban environments, in politically uh, difficult times, we are beginning to feel the overload in North America in terms of the uh, horrendous um, ideas and things that are coming at us, uh, the, the news, um, everything. So uh, the 
I think it is very, very important to uh, continue to observe your own listening also in that context in the sense that how can you find a balance between the overload, the absolute overload, and the uh, need that all of us have to get some uh, quiet and to get some space uh, from constant input. So the extreme of listening to the desert uh, for three weeks, that would be the other extreme where you can experience yourself in a, such a quiet environment that you feel lost. You feel initially lost and it's scary. Uh, so I would say those two situations are similar except that the quiet gives you a, opportunities to, to listen in ways that you cannot when you are completely overloaded. Um, the, uh, I have never lived in a situation like that, so I cannot claim to have the right answer. Um, I can only imagine that the listening that happens between people in a situation such that, like within your families, within friends, within the political uh, movements, um, becomes incredibly important to... Uh, give each other room to listen to each other and not to talk at each other and not to um yes there's room for protest always there has to be protest in situations like that um but at one point at what point is always my questions at what point is the protest uh so desperate that it only that it just needs to shout because it needs to be heard but the listening is becoming more and more difficult. And that in conflict zones is of course what happens is that there's mostly shouting, symbolically speaking, shout, shouting and shooting. And the actual stepping back and listening has no room. And that's, uh, I think when we speak about movements of peace, when we want to uh, create peace, um, that's when the, daring to stop and listen it's like that in relationships when you fight can you dare to stop and listen to each other and listen to that incredible discomfort of of um opposition of hatred is it possible to do that that is the question to me i think it's the biggest challenge Thank you so much. It's not a really clear answer, but yeah. I think we need to stick to the listening. That's what I'm thinking. You know, we need to stick to that. We need to stick to the trusting the fact that our ears are actually to be trusted. And so can we be nice to our ears and say, okay, this is horrible. Can I stop and just listen for a minute? And listen to what's comforting. Listen to what gives you energy. Listen to what makes you feel better. And those things can happen even in extreme war zones. Positive experiences. Thank you. You're welcome. So Hildard, I have a very quick question that builds up on the last one, if you don't mind. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about how um, listening, because I mean, full disclosure, I'm a big fan of your work, and I, I guess if I'm doing anything related to sound, everything started uh, by, with your work when I was first exposed to your work like 10 years ago. Um, and, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts recently about um, um, how listening uh, can also allow us to understand or get a better sense of, of I mean, uh, suffering or social suffering happening in the world right now or um, environmental suffering in general. Um, because, I mean, I, I, I realized that your work, at least uh, that was the impact it had on me that uh, was it's very powerful to, and was very powerful to uh, allow many people to uh, get a deeper sense of our relation with the world, with 
the environment, uh, our surroundings. But uh, do you think it also has that potential to allow more people to understand other people's suffering or understand what's happening uh, to other people in the world far away from our immediate worlds? Um, I must say that I have uh, learned a lot about that through some reading in the Buddhist world, um, where uh, the Buddhists basically um, say that we, if we open ourselves to suffering, uh, to our own suffering, then we can also, like if we're really truly opening ourselves to the most difficult moments in our lives and to the suffering in us, that will bring us closer to the suffering of others. Because we are, as everybody says now, we're all in the same, we're all in this together, right? And everybody says it now in terms of COVID, but it's always been like that. We're in this life together. And so if we dare to listen to the really hard parts in our, within ourselves and begin to understand our own, uh, uh, what, what goes on internally um, and are able to face that and be comfortable with, conf with being confronted with our own unsettled self, with uncomfortable thoughts, with suffering, then we begin to understand every human beings. That is the that is what I've read, and that is what uh, through the practice of listening and through practicing of meditation, um, reading all that. I'm beginning to feel that yes, this is probably the way to go, um, and it means having utterly high respect for your own process, and but also daring to face it daring to face the dark side, daring to face the things that make us cringe about ourselves, right? Um, and so then if we then find that, then we can also begin to bring that into artistic process. And often artistic process is about dealing with the more difficult parts of life, right? So that um, connected with the practice of listening, I think they all go together anyways. We just have to be really conscious of that that's what's happening. We're doing it anyways. It's just sometimes we don't, we don't pay attention to it. We, we overrule ourselves. We, we, we don't stop and notice. So it's in the noticing that I think the key is that we notice that we're suffering and then we can say, okay, what's going on? Does that answer it a bit maybe? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I can only recommend some reading in, in Buddhist writing. There's some fantastic writers and uh, they, they're not so different from what, what I've been ex experiencing over, in life over time uh, through the practice of listening to the environment. I mean, I didn't know that that was going to happen when I first started, I must say. It's, it's become a bit more of an internal, away from the outer external activism, anti-noise, it's become more of an inner journey um but that has direct repercussions on your your actions and then the activism becomes uh, comes from a deeper place perhaps a more grounded place so thank you and maybe that's a good moment to wrap to wrap up now thank you for those wonderful questions everybody yeah. and the other thing is there's a lot of people saying thank you and how fantastic it was to listen and to learn and for example, yeah. saying, uh, someone said how brilliant it is to have so many people coming together to uh, yeah. learn more about sound silence and your work at this time. It's very heartwarming. So, and someone else said yes. um, that uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's in inspirational and educating people to hear is an amazing thing. And yeah, they're so happy to be here. So. Thank yeah. you for setting this up, Nicholas, and thank you for Lasse and Praxis for actually setting all this up and giving us this experience. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fantastic. And um, just as we do wrap up, I'll say, as I said at the beginning, this has been part of a, a series of talks. So if you are interested in sound, ecology, and issues that surround it, we have the next one is on the 6th of October, which is at 
11 o'clock in the morning, uh, Central European time. I think it's still Central European summer time, in fact. But uh, yeah, there's, I've just put a link in our chat, which is also going up with more thanks uh, as we go. But yeah, there's a link there if you'd like to find more information about the next events. Yeah, thank you for everyone for joining us. And uh, thank you so much, Hildegard. It's been really wonderful listening to your work. You're very work. welcome. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks, everybody.